Hello. Here we have the fabled Nintoaster instructional video, which we will watch in a moment. However, I must get this out of the way first. If you don't know anything about electronics at all, or how to use a soldering iron, please just stop this video now because I don't want to hear from, you know, a, a little uh, Billy Joe Bob, you know, left the soldering iron on and burnt his house down, or electrocuted the cat, or something like that. I don't want to hear any of those. So, will not be held responsible for any mishaps. Um, but for the rest of you who maybe do know what you're doing or think you know just enough, um, I'd be curious to see what you come up with. I wish you the best of luck, and the rest of you just curious to see what all goes on, uh, what all goes into making a, a toaster, then, well, this is the video for you. So let's go ahead and uh, get this thing rolling. Enjoy. Technology, you cheap magical whore. From complex wiring interface mechanisms to soldering irons for repairing small electronics, even high technical circuitry of the future. All the way down to the humble toaster. And who doesn't like a good piece of toast? Communists, that's who. And what of these video gaming systems? What would happen if the video game and the toaster were to collide? New toaster instructional video Gonna show you how to make some pointless crap Now before we begin, make sure you're wearing your personal protective equipment. Old clothes will do fine. Our little hobbyist here has chosen a lab coat. Excellent choice. Good hobbyist. And it's always a good idea to wear face protectants, such as glasses or goggles. Here we see that our hobbyist is clearly insane. Now we're ready to begin working, right? Wrong. Where's your anti-static wrist strap? Well, you're going to need one. If you don't already own an anti-static wrist strap, one can be fashioned from some tin foil and spare wiring. First, wrap a liberal amount of tin foil around your wrist, like so. Second, attach one end of your wire to the tin foil using an alligator clip, like the one shown here. Third, Attach the other end of the wire to a good grounded source, like copper water piping. Now we're ready to begin work. But before we start, here's a short list of parts that you're likely to need throughout the video. A Phillips head screwdriver. A soldering iron. A desoldering iron. Some solder wick. Solder. An X-Acto knife. Pliers wire strippers, a Dremel or similar rotary tool, a digital multimeter, varying lengths of test cable with alligator clip ends, a smaller screwdriver set, a hot glue gun, plenty of extra glue, a lighter, which may come in handy later, epoxy, more epoxy, 
more epoxy. A good set of drill bits will also come in handy. Electrical tape. Measuring tape. A pen. Painter's tape. Q-tips. Extra lengths of spare wiring. And personal fuel. Now we're ready to begin disassembling the Nintendo Entertainment System. Let's flip the console over and take a look at the bottom. You'll notice that there are six screws holding the two halves of the casing together. Use your Phillips head screwdriver to remove them, please. Now that the screws have been extracted, we can remove her top. Now we have an additional seven screws to remove in order to detach the RF shielding. You'll also want to remove the two screws that hold the RF modulator in place in the upper right corner of the unit. Unfortunately, we're not done yet. Six more screws will need to be removed in order to detach the black cartridge loading mechanism. Now, gently lift the board and grab the cartridge loading mechanism, shimmying to and fro until it's removed from the unit. Good hobbyist. Now we'll need to remove the 72-pin cartridge connector from the board, again gently rocking it back and forth until it's freed from the board's edge connector. Next, we'll need to disconnect three cables from the main board. The power and reset connector, and the player one and player two controller port connectors. The NES board is now naked. If you're already lost, please stop the tape and find a new hobby. Since we're modding this board anyway, there are a few things we should take care of. There's a small chip near the lower right-hand corner of the board with the word Nintendo written on it. This is the lockout chip, which prevents playing certain third-party unlicensed games. Cutting pin number four will disable the lockout chip. There's also the unutilized expansion port, which can and should be removed to save space. These two rows of pins on the reverse side of the board must be desoldered in order to remove the expansion port. This is where our desoldering iron will come in handy. It's one of the many tedious but necessary tasks that you'll encounter throughout the process. If you do not know how to use a desoldering iron, Please stop the tape and learn how to use a desoldering iron. Once removed, feel free to keep the expansion port around for spare parts. This hunk of crap in the corner is the RF modulator, which is unneeded and should be removed as well. However, there's a 7805 voltage regulator attached to this part that we will need later. Please desolder it from the modulator and keep it somewhere safe. Desoldering the RF modulator from the NES board isn't going to be quick or fun. A higher wattage soldering iron may be necessary to remove the thick gobs of solder that holds it together. My god, it's as if T-1000 sneezed on the damn board. Who attaches crap like this? What's wrong with a nut and bolt?
I end up wanting to strangle an infant every time I have to remove one. You may find it necessary to use your desoldering wick here. It soaks up the excess solder like a sponge and helps to pull it out of hard to reach crevices. A flathead screwdriver and some good old American elbow grease will come in handy here. Be patient. It can take some time to wedge the RF modulator from the board. Once the RF modulator is removed, store it somewhere for safekeeping. Now that we've removed both the expansion port and RF modulator from the board, we can see that it's much thinner and easier to work with overall. This will prove advantageous when trying to fit it into tight spots. Giggity. However, since the RF modulator has been removed from the board, we'll need to make a small modification in order to get a clean video signal from the system. We'll need to build a simple video amplifier circuit and attach it to this area of the board where we remove the RF modulator. But before we do any of that, we should take a moment to identify what these five solder points on the board are used for. This is the cartridge connector. We'll be getting up close and personal with it later, but for now, it's unimportant. I don't remember why I pointed it out in this illustration. Moving on. Going from left to right, the first solder connection is where the video signal comes out of the unit. However, the signal is normally amplified by the RF modulator, which we already removed. We will later connect our video amplifier circuit to this solder point. The second solder point is where the audio signal comes out of the NES. This audio signal may now sound a little softer than it did originally, but it shouldn't need any additional adjustments other than simply turning the volume on your TV up a few more clicks. The third solder point is where we will feed 5 volts DC into the board to power it. This needs to be as close to exactly 5 volts as possible. Any more, and you'll fry the sensitive chips on the board. Any less, and the system will not properly turn on. The fourth and fifth solder points, when shorted, will cause the system to reset. In other words, touching these two points together is the same as pressing the reset button as you would normally. You can disregard these connectors if your Nintoaster won't have a reset button. Finally, you'll see a lot of flat silver areas surrounding the board, usually around the screw holes. This is ground. Now that we know what the solder connections do, we should build our video amplifier circuit. You'll only need a few cheap parts in order to accomplish this, all of which can be found at your local Radio Shack for a few meager dollars. These parts are a 220 ohm resistor, a 33 ohm resistor, a 2N4401 transistor, and a small piece of perf board to stick all of the parts on. Here's a simple schematic of the video amp circuit. Please, pause the tape and construct this component. Great! Your completed video amp should look something like this. Please ensure that your video amp is properly wired to the NES board. If you're uncertain, here's a good example of how it should be wired. Let's focus on the cartridge connector for a moment. This is the cartridge connector that we removed from the NES board earlier. We won't be using it because it's poorly designed, and it sucks. Instead, we'll be using the cartridge connector that's inside of a Game Genie. If you don't already own a Game Genie that you don't mind sacrificing for this project, you should try obtaining one from an online auction or flea market. This is what a Game Genie looks like. You'll need to dismantle the Game Genie and desolder the 72-pin cartridge connector from the circuit board. Once removed, store the Game Genie circuit board somewhere safe. It's a good idea to secure the cartridge connector to a surface, and some perf board is an excellent solution. 
It can easily be found at most electronics suppliers, like Radio Shack. The pins probably won't line up perfectly, so they'll probably need to be fanned out just slightly in order to fit them all through the holes on the perf board. Eventually, we will be using wire to connect the Game Genie cartridge connector to the NES board. But before we do any of that, we need to start planning how we're going to fit everything into the toaster. How you ultimately want your Nintoaster to look and operate is entirely up to you, and rarely are the insides of two toasters the same. Toasters are unique, like snowflakes. Plan and measure everything out before you get too far ahead of yourself. Premature modification is no laughing matter. Let's see what we have to work with on the inside. Remove any screws that may be holding the toaster together and take her top off. We can easily see that there's a lot of unnecessary junk that will need to be removed, like the heating elements, for example. Let's see how our NES board will fit into the toaster. It looks like a tight fit, but I think we'll be just fine. Let's slim things down a little bit on the inside by removing some of the unnecessary crap, like the heating elements. Wire cutters, and occasionally brute force, may be needed. Be sure not to completely destroy too much of the structure, as some of it may still be useful for mounting the various boards and connectors inside of the toaster. We also need to begin thinking about how we want the lever to turn the system on and off. Again, each toaster will be a little different, but ultimately, it's the same idea. We need the act of pressing the lever down to activate a switch. With this toaster in particular, we can see that this task can be accomplished by strategically mounting a momentary push-button switch inside of the toaster in such a way that it's physically pressed by the inner workings when the lever is dropped. Clever hobbyist. Now it's time to start getting dangerous. Here we have our AC adapter that we're going to use as the main power source. As you can see, we've already cut and stripped the wires. Before wiring it into our Nintoaster, we should test it to be sure of the voltage and polarity. Oftentimes, you'll notice that one of the two wires has a line or dashes on it. In this case, the dashed line indicates ground. Ideally, our AC adapter should be outputting somewhere between 10 and 12 volts DC. We'll test the AC adapter using our trusty digital multimeter. Use alligator clips to connect the positive and negative wires from the adapter to the respective probes on your multimeter. Set your multimeter accordingly and check the readout. Here we see that our AC adapter is giving us approximately 12.8 volts DC. This will work just fine. You may recall me mentioning earlier that you should never give more than 5 volts DC to the NES board, yet our AC adapter is giving us almost 13 volts. How do we turn 13 volts into 5 volts? This is the 7805 voltage regulator, which I also mentioned earlier. It'll take in the 13 volts from our AC adapter and drop it down to an even 5 volts which we can send to the NES board. It has three pins. From left to right, the first pin is where we'll connect our unregulated 13 volt power source. The middle pin is ground, as is the metal area on the back of the 7805. And the third pin is our 5 volts DC output that will go to the NES board. This is a basic diagram of how we'll be wiring up the AC adapter to the 7805 and power switch, and ultimately the NES board. Please, pause the tape, study the diagram, and understand it. Great! We'll be jumping all over the place now, so I hope you're keeping notes. 
The 7805 voltage regulator turns the excess voltage into heat. Normally, we'd mount the 7805 to a heat sink, which you still can do, but here we've decided to mount it directly to the metal structure of the toaster, which works as well. Of course, this will probably mean you'll be drilling a hole to mount your 7805. This is going to take some patience depending on the type of drill you're using, the quality of your drill bits, and what you're drilling into. Our little hobbyist here is at a disadvantage, tasked with drilling through thick steel with a small battery powered Dremel. It can be done, but it will take some time. Stay sharp, rookie. Remember our 72 pin cartridge connector from earlier? We'll need to start thinking about how we're going to fit this connector into the toaster. This may involve a decent amount of cutting and shaping, depending on how you need it to fit into your toaster. When deciding where to mount the cartridge connector, give mind to how much of the game cartridge you want to stick out of the top. Ideally, that would be enough to firmly grip the game and remove it from the system during normal use. Mark, measure, take notes. We want to make sure that plugging a game into the cartridge connector isn't a game in itself. In order to ensure that the game will slide straight down into the connector regardless of how drunk you are, we've decided to use two pieces of plexiglass curved at the ends using a strip heater. If you don't own a strip heater, a heat gun and some nimble fingers can get the job done. I'm sure that this task can be accomplished cheaper and easier. But this is what I chose, so suck it. Get your adhesives ready, cause shit's about to get real. Squeeze out a liberal amount of high strength epoxy onto a disposable mixing surface. Mix thoroughly until the color is uniform. After deciding exactly how we want our plexiglass guides to be positioned, carefully tack them into place using your epoxy or other high strength adhesive. You're about to embark on what will probably be the most tedious task of the whole process. We'll need to connect our new 72 pin cartridge connector to the NES board using many small lengths of wire. Personally, I recommend using some old 40 or 80 pin IDE hard drive cable. These cables can easily be harvested from old computers. Use your X-Acto knife to carefully separate the wires. We'll need a total of 72 wires. Stripping the ends of these small wires can be tricky unless you have wire strippers that can handle very small wires. Personally, I've found that human teeth make great wire strippers, especially for these tiny wires. Use a small amount of solder to tin the ends of the wires. This will help when soldering the wires to the NES board and cartridge connector. As you can see here, we've also tinned the edge connector pins on the NES board. Now. Attaching a wire to a pin on the board should be as simple as momentarily touching your soldering iron to where the wire and pin meet, remelting the solder on both ends so that they flow together and attach. Please be patient, this part is going to take some time. Don't rush yourself, or you run the risk of crossing wires and creating problems. So you've soldered all 72 wires to the NES board. Excellent work! You're only halfway there. You now need to attach the other end of the wires to the cartridge connector. This will take just as long as it took to solder to the NES board, if not longer. Be strong. Enjoy this aardvark while you wait. Once you're done with this part, take a moment to enjoy a refreshing beer, fine wine, or apple juice if you're underage. 
Now it's a good idea to mix up some more high strength epoxy and attach the cartridge connector to the structure of the toaster. I don't think I need to go into detail. You should know how to glue shit to other shit by now. It's time to briefly discuss the LED lighting, should you choose to include it into your net toaster. The LEDs can be wired in series or parallel. Here, I've chosen to wire them in parallel, because I felt like it, and I'm not that great at math. Here's a diagram of how each LED is hooked up to our NIN toaster using the 5 volts DC coming from the 7805 voltage regulator. The particular LED I chose requires me to place a 150 ohm resistor in front of the 5 volt source so that the LED does not burn out. Your LEDs may differ. If you need help finding out how much resistance to put in front of your LEDs, there are several good LED resistor calculators at your disposal, easily found on the World Wide Web. In order to dim on a whim, wow, that's awful. In order to dim on a whim, we've put a potentiometer or variable resistor in line with the 5 volt source to adjust how much voltage is going to the LEDs. This ultimately adjusts their brightness. While we still have the epoxy out, secure the resistors and LEDs to the inner workings such that they don't flop around all willy-nilly, which nobody likes. Nobody. NOBODY! This is the AC adapter we'll be using to power the system. It's not necessary to build the AC adapter inside of the toaster, but we're going to do it anyway. Disassemble the AC adapter and attach a pair of wires to the AC input and DC output of the adapter. Using a thicker gauge wire for the AC input is always a good idea. Here you can see that we're using another curved piece of plexiglass to protect the solder side of the AC adapter so that it doesn't make contact with the metal structure of the toaster and short out. If you haven't done so already, solder the 7805 to a spare piece of perf board and begin running your wires, remembering to run an extra 5 volt line over to the potentiometer and LEDs. Remember this diagram from earlier? Refer back to it often. Here we see our 7805 wired and attached to the metal structure of the toaster, which should help dissipate heat. Here, our finished wiring job looks nowhere near as clean as the diagram, but it is wired correctly, and that's what matters. If you had to make any splices, be sure to cover them up with black tape or heat shrink tubing, as shown here. The tubing can be shrunk down using a heat gun or lighter. See? I told you we'd need a lighter. I'll bet you thought that I was bullshitting. Now let's tackle an issue you'll probably have with the controller ports. You may notice that the wires on the controller ports aren't long enough to work with your toaster design. If this is the case, simply cut the wires about halfway down and use spare lengths of wiring to splice them back together, again isolating each of the splices from each other with black tape to prevent shorts. Here's an example of how that's done. Excellent. After cleverly mounting the ports to yet another piece of plexiglass that will fit into the toaster, we'll take a look at the reset button. We'll need to connect two wires from our reset button to two specific spots on the NES board, which I'll point out after we're done spinning the toaster around and... Okay, now zoom a little. There we go. Right there. And there. Marvelous. 
or if you prefer, there and there. Moving along. Let's focus on the AV jacks for a moment. These jacks here, for example, were salvaged from an old VCR. They can also be purchased new at your favorite online parts distributor in case you don't have any old equipment to cannibalize. Using some spare wire, connect the audio and video signals from the NES board and video amplifier to your AV jacks. Make sure that each jack is grounded as well, or you won't hear or see squat. Many bad video signal problems stem from improper grounding. Now might be a good time to turn everything on and make sure that it all still works. If it doesn't, then you did something wrong. Retrace your steps and double check everything. At this point, your Nintoaster is essentially complete. We just need to finish adhering all the necessary parts into place and box it all up. A lot of epoxy and or hot glue will be consumed in the process. Here, we're making sure that the controller ports and reset button are secured using various adhesives and techniques. Of course, you'll also need to drill holes for the AV ports and mount them into place as well. In this case, using a high strength epoxy designed for adhering to metal surfaces. Carefully reassemble your Nintoaster, being sure not to forget any screws, fasteners, washers, bolts, clips, or knobs along the way. Knobs. I believe congratulations are in order. Yay! Connect and test your Nintoaster, using it as you would normally. Grab a grilled cheese sandwich. Play your favorite game and revel in your accomplishment. Your internet pals will fancy you some kind of genius. If it doesn't work, you fucked something up. Try again until it works. Thanks for watching and happy modding.